Hello and welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy, and More with your host, John Henry Sheridan. And tonight I am excited to be hanging out with the creative duo, Tyrants in Therapy. And if you're curious what that means, well, just stick, stay tuned to find out. So thanks for being here, guys. Thank you. Right, so we got Abby and Michael from Tyrants in Therapy. So uh, just briefly to let people know that um, I met Abby at a uh, CD Baby conference and um, it was like very brief, right? It was it's like a sort of meet and greet virtually, something to that effect. Yeah, right? it was a breakout room on a giant Zoom uh, meeting that put four or maybe eight of us together, six of us. We mm -hmm. were able to sort of find out what everybody was up to and what we were there for. And so, yeah, so we, and then John Henry told us about his Music is Life podcast and philosophy. So we said, oh, well, we would be good guests for that, right? Right. So here we yeah. are. Awesome. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, the marvels of modern technology and you guys are on the other side of the country, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? In yeah. the Los Angeles area. Uh, in the Los Angeles, California area. Here I am in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, and we're just going to hang out and uh, and vibe. Excellent. So, so uh, without further ado, so we could get some live questions. We may not, depending on how it goes. Um, either way, it'll be up on Facebook and then uh, archived on YouTube afterwards. And I'll share with you the link to use as you'd like. Uh, so we have... Uh, a viewer. Hey, anyone who's watching live, thank you so much for being here and uh, feel free to throw in a question and hit that like or love button and share it. All right. So uh, can you tell us, um, either one of you feel free to jump in. Can you tell us about how you two met and got started as the tyrants in therapy? You want me to go? Michael and I met in an improv class um, and he was starting to get into the music business and I was sort of transitioning out of the acting business, um, came, came up through theater and film and TV. And um, we just really hit it off. We had similar senses of humor and you know, he was in getting into music and needed a vocalist for a demo. So I said, oh yeah, sure, I sing. <laughs> and um, so we did, a, we did a demo and it became a very productive collaboration and and then we ended up as tyrants in therapy. <laughs> um, anything to add to that, Michael? No. There was more to it. Will you care to divulge any? Uh, yeah, I, I will. I mean, we, we, the song that we were working on was called Hollywood Friendships. And it was really, in retrospect, a really cornball song that I wrote with an entertainment lawyer. And um, it was it was very earnest. And you know, it's like when you're writing for the first time, you're burying your heart on your sleeve. And I was kind of in a, in a very unhappy marriage at that point. And I met Abby and all of a sudden, um, I, you know, she- She grew wings. Right. Mm -hmm. She was so accepting of, of, of the dreams and the aspirations that I had um, and, you know, had her own. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was such a liberating thing that uh, we ultimately became married. We became married. Yes. <laughs> it sounds so and final. God officiated <laughs> at the wedding. Yes. And, um, and he, he allowed us to he said, come and live on the earth for another 200 years and then join me and the angels and Elvis. Wow, and so, that's what happened. Huh? <laughs> no, we're still waiting for the call. We're, we're in the green room um, of, of life. But uh, no, we've, we've gone on an interesting journey. And um, as collaborators, I've had many collaborators abby's had many collaborators. yeah michael had a band kind of a punk band um to start out with and i always just loved rock and roll and all kinds of music and as i said before i was acting and then there were union strikes and i started writing and anyway eventually we started moving 
closer to collaborating and um, started we started writing songs together with other people as well so it, it was an evolution and then we had uh, a friend who had a, a dance music label so he said you know if you could do anything it would be like a dance record I'll put it out and we really didn't have anything like that so he says look I'll put you together with uh, these scratchers and that was like in the early 82 Mid 83 and um, these guys would scratch records, you know, vinyl records with 808 drum machines mm -hmm. in and out. And they were, it was called the um, Knights of the Turntable. And, mm -hmm. and they did all kinds of weird stuff. And then, well, they came to a session, but they didn't bring any vinyl. So it, I had that, some vinyl. So we brought, brought we some. had like um, Bible stories as told by Charlton Heston. We had greatest speeches of presidential uh, presidential speeches and fairy tale a fairy tale record or something so bible stories they scratched to that and we made up this and we made up a song around it and <laughs> and it became somewhat of an underground hit it's been licensed a couple of times to germany and speaking of germany there was another song that i'd written in collaboration with a jingle writer who was he's quite a good musician named Carl Freiberg called In the Shadow of Hitler. And, and and I said, could I put that? He says, on the B side, I don't care what you put. And then one time after an acid trip, we came back and Abby was really feeling bad. So I laid down next to her on the bed and was trying to comfort her. And there were some keys on the bed. And when I banged my my arm on it, it sounded like percussion. So it's a boom, tsh, tsh, boom, tsh, tsh. <laughs> and I kept chanting out, underground girl of the world, underground girl of the world. And then Abby answered in, and that became a record. And um, that was actually an EP. So the, the scratching record was called Three People Nude Below the Waist. And the other song he's talking about is Underground Girl of the World and uh, Shadow of Hitler. So it's, it's quite a classic. EP if you can find it anywhere. Yeah, it's going like for 150 bucks. Jesus. <laughs> wow. More it's, than we ever got when it was released. Yeah, yeah they didn't do much. <laughs> but like I say, it's been licensed a few times and people liked it, you know, after a while. Especially in England and also in Poland of all places. Hmm. Wow. So. I, yeah, I heard a few of your dance tracks from the 80s from what I could tell. Super smooth, super well written, fun. I could definitely see that being a thing that would just kind of take on in clubs, you know, underground clubs with people are dancing, especially at that time before internet. So it's like if you hear a song from another uh, country, or another nationality, it's it's got that mystique to it, you know, like well, where did this come from? In the U.S., it was not underground clubs. It was more like mainstream discos uh, that played high energy, which meant really in, in America, a gay people and Latin people. Mm -hmm. And uh, those, those were our big fans in the 80s and 90s. Um, and then, you know, after a while, we decided to be truer to ourselves and say, well, you know, we always liked this kind of uh, Spike Jones meets the talking heads. And so uh, mixed in with well, weirder, weirder some, stuff. Some really just... pretty or profound stuff, too. And um... and some fun stuff. I mean, I think both of us have kind of sharp senses of humor. So we, you know, some of our lyrics tended to be a little bit, they were witty, but also social commentary, political commentary. Um, and when we do our live show, we mix that in with, some of the more dancey stuff, it comes out to what we call punk cabaret. So we kind of coined that phrase for what we do on stage. Actually, there's somebody named, what's her name? Samantha? No, no, no. Amanda um, Palmer. Amanda Palmer. Who was with the Dresden Dolls, and she coined that phrase for herself uh, on the East Coast. So she And on the, in the early days of the internet, she Googled punk cabaret, and we came up, so she contacted us and there was really no reason to collaborate or anything she was that was like the beginning of her 
Ascent. I don't know if you're familiar with the Dresden Dolls. And I, I know the name. I definitely have seen yeah. their records in shops over the years or right. something. Yeah. And they're not together anymore, but she went on to have her own career. And yeah. Maybe he did too. So she know. says we should exchange CDs, which we did. And now we're, we're like the Western Roman Empire. She's the Eastern Roman Empire. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's fun to hear. It's also, I'm, I'm definitely impressed by your longevity and, and I'll get to that question a little little later. Um, okay, so I got to ask about the, the name of the group. You know, it, it definitely, I won't say stung me, but it struck me like, uh, you know, what is that? You know, are, are these people going to be uh, tyrannical, <laughs> you know, and need therapy? You know, it has that, you know, to call yourselves that, especially for so long. I wonder what it was that sparked, it was a pretty strong, you know, name for a group. I think every person who's ever worked with us has probably thought that we were tyrants and we did need therapy. <laughs> so, but Abby actually overheard me uh, working with a collaborator who is a DJ uh, at, at a big gay nightclub in Los Angeles called Rage. And, but he desperately wanted to be a songwriter and producer. And um, so we were writing and arguing and this and that. And then what at a rather high level. And I said, God, listening to you guys, it sounds like you're tyrants in therapy. And everybody got a big laugh out of that. And we just kind of hung on to the name like, hmm, that's mm -hmm. pretty appropriate for us because Michael and I have very strong opinions about our art and our creativity and if we hear something you know we're like fighting for you know let's make it this way not that way and and um and yet the therapy part of it is that we're trying to overcome those tendencies that we're trying to be more or we hopefully we have by now become more user friendly <laughs> more easy easy to uh make things happen and get along and collaborate and not have it be such a fraught experience. <laughs> yeah, we've learned we've learned where we can go and where we can't go with each other. Right, and, right. Uh, I mean, you learn that with, with other people, but... In all when, relationships that last. When it's your significant other, we have, I mean, you know, after whatever we're doing musically, we have to go back and live with each other. And, yeah. So That's, all that broken crockery on the floor just doesn't work at dinner time. Yeah, you know, kind of, you have to eat well, off paper plates. Uh, you know, and, and you say, "Oh, honey, I'll clean that up," and she says, "You better fucking well, your lawyer <laughs> broke it," and um, it's uh, wow. it's an adventure. Yeah, so I definitely was curious about um, if you guys were a couple, and I got the feeling that you probably were, but it wasn't so clear, you know, from your. The way you guys present yourself and uh i was thinking if so it's got to be a challenge you know to have yeah. creative are you married creative yeah mm -hmm. you are okay so you know there... that's a full-time job in itself sometimes you know when you're having your different biorhythms together and then you know what it's like when you're collaborating because you've been in bands but you're are you in a band now john henry not at the moment but i've been in Quite a few, yeah, Same and many just the, creative collaborations in various ways, you know. So you know how smooth those the situations can go, right? <laughs> well, the the tyrants have had. So what's ours is to the tenth power, but uh, the tyrants have had a kind of a floating um, cast of characters. We started out with um, a girl I was working with in advertising. And she was, she, I, you know, we, we got stoned during lunch. And I said, do you want to be in a band? She said, okay. You know, and she didn't really know what that was going to entail. And she didn't sing and she didn't play an instrument, but she's an art director and she had a great look and she, she was had a game. Good aesthetic. And, yeah, good aesthetic. And she was game. And so it was like, okay, we all got along at that time. <laughs> and but she didn't want to get to the next level, which in, maybe she, taking yeah. some singing lessons and you know and she didn't want to rehearse because it was bar time to be with her girlfriends and to go out you know bar hopping so we'd like okay we've done one rehearsal we're out of here and it was like well no we're gonna 
run through the set again. So we get good. And we're going to do this again for the next, you know, three nights this week, and it's going to happen next week in the wind. And that was like. A deal breaker. Well, she, so. no, she was with us for about a year or well, so. Well, that's true. Yeah, we did. We, we did, went we to, did, you know, we toured 10, with her. 15. We went up to Portland and yeah. did some shows. Yeah, wow. But it was so, you know, then we, we also had some live players. Um, but I, as, as you. That didn't work. We'll realize if you listen to the body of work we do, it's all over the place. <laughs> and so a lot of times, you know, guys who can play rock and roll, can't play funk. Guys who can play funk can't play rock and roll in country. Uh, you know, unless you're a professional musician and forget about getting those guys to be in a new wave band in Los Angeles. Because, yeah, they're all studio cats. You know, they, it's the same way in New York. Expensive. Nope. They won't Professional play. musicians don't do speculative things as much as they should. And that's why <laughs> they make money. <laughs> and, but they never, get in, they never get in really big bands because it's too hard to give up. The, the money they make, but so most of the people who make it as as bands are usually talented amateurs who get really really good playing in front of people after they've had a hit, and um, right yeah anyway, okay. I see but, but but as as it got went on we realized it was very hard to keep a, a band together because. Uh, it had to be a meritocracy and sometimes people wanted to you know they love this great idea and it's my turn to write a song and then you'd hear it and you're like well it's just not up to the our standards you know michael and i have similar tastes and not that we don't argue about stuff but or they wanted to sing more and they weren't really good lead singers you know we had a girl with us for a while who had a beautiful voice but it was just very bland you know she didn't really have much to express. We had another girl who had a huge ego, wanted to sing, and her voice was horrible. And so, you know, you just have to weigh all those things and be diplomatic at the same time, you know, you got a lead. So that's why the revolving door. So finally, probably we, you've had that experience too. Right? We had a, yeah. um, <laughs> we, you know, we fired the last tyrant. And we, no, then she we, went away. No, no, no. We, no, no. Stacy? No. Oh, yeah. Okay. You're right. Yeah. She moved away and we got this big gig for, I don't know, $1,500 to go play a disco. And it was like, you know, back then as today, it's not bad. So we said, God, should we do it by ourselves? Just the two of us? So we said, okay, well, you know, let's just do it. So we did it ourselves, just the two of us. We said, oh my God, what are they going to think? We're going out there ourselves. And after the show, people said, oh, God, this is the best I've ever seen you. You guys are so good. It was like so focused and so. Um, it was really affirming. And so after that, it was like, we'll bring people in when we're recording because we always play with other musicians. Um, we're more, you know, writers and producers than, you know, I play a little guitar. Michael doesn't, you know, we both sing, but we collaborate. But live. I can hum. But live, you know, it's. We have, we, we're a track act, so we play to tracks, but it's more like an act and it's a performance. And mm -hmm. there's some inner, you know, you were asking earlier about some of the skits that you've seen us do. And um, we'll do a little, we try to do a little comic interlude, sort of a throwback to, you know, the variety shows of the 50s and the 60s when you'd, you'd have a little banter between the show and, so it's a pretty um, smooth situation, you know. We when the when we start playing our CD, the show goes usually about twenty two minutes. Well, yeah, our song, our music, our music. Yeah, it's um, it's a lot of content. So we don't do forty five minute sets like we mm -hmm. used to, and um, and so it's more like a. It, you really felt like you've been entertained and seen a performance when it's finished. Um, I'd rather do two or three sets than do one long set because it's it's so much for people to absorb, uh, and you know it's it's just too much for them intellectually and sonically. So uh, too much of a good thing. Yeah.
Yeah, and I would say the era too. I mean, I think it's super rare for, for people these days to be able to take in a lot of new music, right? Unless they're, yeah. you know, just like super fans of Tarantine Therapy, then they can probably listen to an hour. But uh, but yeah, for yeah, I've been in many original bands and just whenever you're kind of pushing beyond that 30 minute mark, I don't know, 20 years ago, my I guess was a bit different, but uh, yeah, people, Attention spans patience, really patience, yeah, attention spans, so, so, uh, so threadbare. Yeah. Well, that's, right. that's why God invented covers. Um, yeah. And then, you know, you, you do your own spin on. Yeah, to me, that's like swimming in a pool and you're learning to swim and somebody says, swim this hundred yard pool. You know, you've got to like, it's so long. If you just grab on to, uh, playing a cover of a song that everybody knows and loves is sort of like gripping onto the edge of the pool. To me, it gives the audience a chance to rest and go, ah, you know, my nervous system is now processing something that's familiar. Now I'm ready for the next new thing. Abby does a Sammy Hagar yeah. song as a cover. Wow. Yeah. And I do a Slade song. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it gives people a change up. And then she sings a song that the Beatles did that was really written by Arthur Alexander called Anna. Hmm. Which is a ma male to fe female song. She does it's a female to female. Hmm. And when, Very we play, pretty song. when we play lesbian bars, there's always a, a kind of, of a hush in a the listening. audience. Yeah, yes, it's yeah. like, wow, this is not something we see every day. But maybe hmm. more so these days than back then. Right. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, yeah, covers. <clears throat> I found when I was doing Facebook Lives the past two years of the during the pandemic time, I, I was did that for a little bit. I, my strategy was uh, I would do twelve song sets, um, and every I guess four covers to what is that eight eight originals something like that. Oh, that's what good. were the covers that you did? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a singer songwriter, so I would mix in. I, I have an enormous library that I could do. So I might be a Billy Joel song, a James Taylor song, Cure song. I do a lot of heavy metal covers, like I'm, a lot of Iron Maiden songs, just me and acoustic guitar, Halloween. Uh, yeah, just a, a, quite a variety. Um, Black Sabbath song, you know, and uh, then I'll just put in my own song just because, you know, hey, I'm going to play. I might as well. Put my own yeah. I have a lot of original songs too so I just want to you know give them a little bit of life and uh, that was cool um, but yeah for me I'm not performing much even Facebook live nowadays I'm more focused on writing writing my books mm -hmm. for some reason performing is just I don't know it, uh, it's, it's not moving me like it used to uh, yeah well, so uh comes and goes, you know, I mean, it's a different headspace to perform. Yeah. To, to write and. Yeah. I'd say for me, I, I feel it's definitely more shallow to perform in the sense that when you create, you got to go deeper ten, generally. I mean, maybe night after night you go deep, but just for that small period, you know, but because there's a like a rinse and repeat thing um, with writing. I feel like I really need deep work for almost like uh, being in the womb type of thing. Really need protected, deep, mm -hmm. energetic Are you place. writing, you're writing a book? Yeah, uh, my next, the book that should be coming out this fall is called Mind Your Music. Mm -hmm. And it's really about the uh, energy, the potential of positive and negative energy in music. And for us to really be aware of what we're listening to so that we can empower ourselves in the best way. Uh, kind of like being aware of what we eat type of thing. I see. Yeah. It's more of a spiritual approach to the sense of hearing and what you're taking in through your... Yeah, like a hearing. mind, body, spirit. Yeah, mind, body, spirit type of thing. Uh, nice. Thinking instead of we are what we eat, I say I redefine it to we are what we consume. And then including all media, all, you know, music and movies and various things. Absolutely, I, I can see that. Yeah, it, it's it's a pretty short book. I put it. It was an ebook that I wrote in the end of 2015. I wrote it in a day, okay. 
there is like this challenge to myself. So I was so busy at the time and I really wanted to do a book at the end of the year, that last week before New Year's, I chose a day and I did this program, write a book in 24 hours. Basically it took me eight days to write it and then do all the formatting and everything, get a cover and release it. Wow. And it, it was, it was called Music for Health and with this big subtitle. And I'm just really glad I proved that I could do it, but I never felt super proud of it. I promoted it. Some people read it, got a few reviews, but then I just let it sit. And then over the years, I'm like, I really want to do a paperback version of it. And every time I went to do it, I would read it. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> I want to change. At least I got to change this. And then I'm like, oh, man, then do I, I might have to call it a second edition because I think you technically can't really change anything if you just make a paperback version of an mm-hmm. ebook. Mm. You know, so then I started doing that and it just became way too different that uh, I, I was working with an editor and then she recommended what, or one of us came up with the idea of we'll just give it a whole new title. Anyway, it, it's been a wrestling match, mm. been a wrestling match to come up with this and a lot of back and forth. She's a really great collaborator who I'm working with, uh, but at the same time, she's challenging me to be my best and that's not, uh, it's not easy. <laughs> No, going out of your comfort zone or what you think, you know, you're when you're really stretching and someone's asking for more, it's an act of faith, right? That you you've got more territory. And it's just a question of getting past the discomfort of breaking through that eggshell. Yeah. Especially when when I saw this book as just something I wanted to get done with so I could work on the book I really want to work on, which is my autobiography. So it's I just want to get this out of my system almost like constipated, I got to just get it, get it out so I can live normal and do the next thing. But at the same time, it was like, it's a good message. So why shortchange it if you're going this far, why not make it as best as it can be? So anyway, I'm glad, no regrets, but it's been, you know, quite a challenge. So um, what inspired you guys? Thanks for listening. Sure. What inspired? Yeah, absolutely. Dialogue. It's super, you know, super important to have meaningful dialogue these days I, I, in any era, I guess, but certainly nowadays. Yeah. Um, what inspired you both to take music seriously and pursue it as a public presence, as a career, however you want to uh, term it? To me, it had all the elements of what I liked about life. I mean, uh, you could be creative Uh, in those days you could actually make a lot of money at it Mm. which is not the case anymore Uh, and but was that a motivator did you think no but it it wasn't it didn't you know it wasn't like a a, a not a right right right. you know i mean um and you know it was it was a very in those days really if you weren't in the business, it was everybody really liked musicians. And they still do. They think it's a cool lifestyle. You know, sitting around, creating all day, doing drugs, you know, having orgies with with whoever, you know, wants to hang out, uh, going well, this, places. This is like well, a this mindset is best, from the seventies. This, well, Jesus. this is best case scenario. <laughs> and, well, also, when you're twenty, right, or when yeah. you're yeah. And, and, and um, you know, it was, it, I mean, I, I liked that kind of thing. I liked being around with, in fact, in my first marriage, when I told this woman that I was married to that I wanted to really be a, a songwriter full time, she burst into tears and said, you're going to sit around all day and, and smoke dope and write songs? And I said, yes. And uh, she said, "Oh my God!" And and it, you know, I could just see this was not this was not somebody that was going down the same road as me. You know, she it's not for everybody. And, yeah. But you know, it, it I liked the people in it. They were smart and they were artistic, and I just like music too. I mean, that was the, the bottom line. Even today, with the with the abysmal. Um, this conditions financially if i didn't like music i wouldn't be in it still because mm-hmm. and i always love music too but as an actor 
um, I, you know, got to the point where you, so much, especially if you're an actor in film and television, it's so cosmetic. And, you know, if you don't look the part, you know, you don't even, I mean, I heard a story about an actress who like put her head in the door at a casting session and said, how am I so far? And they said, you're all wrong, but come on in and read anyway. I mean, it was like that. So, <laughs> and so I just, I, I was frustrated because once you could get an audition and go read, if you got the part, that's great. But, but it was usually, you couldn't do much. And an actor's sort of, not the caboose of the train, but, you know, it's really a director's medium or a producer's medium. And, and so when I started to sing and realized I could write my own songs and express my own characters and shape my own delivery system. It's much more empowering. It, it was yeah. empowering. I mean, it's also much more naked and it's much more scary because, you know, you don't have those handrails that like, oh, yeah, I'm an actor and I'm here's my agent and these are the shows I was on. Um, it's a little bit more free flowing, but um, at the same time, it was very liberating. And so I think that that helped me kind of sift and sort what I didn't want and what I did want as a creative person. And so that that kept me kind of on that track. Wow. Yeah, it's uh, very inspiring, you know, that you, Abby, in this case, uh, really just wanted that creative freedom, you know, and that you're willing to put that first over whatever the well, success. It's, it's sort of, of like an, if you're an athlete and you're on a great team, but you're on the bench most of the time. I mean, it's like mm -hmm. you feel that creative impulse kind of circling the drain <laughs> every week. And it's like, well, well, let me get in there and, you know, not just to prove my stuff, but let me practice my stuff. Let me get better at my stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. I was in an episode of Laverne and Shirley. Mm -hmm. And I remember that Cindy Williams, I always thought, Cindy, I apologize if you're watching this, but I always thought she was kind of a, um, she went to my high school. I didn't know her there, but she did, she was in my high school. She was really kind of a, 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 not a very, didn't have much range as an actress, but the fact that she got to be on a show that how many seasons was that show on? Like 10 years longer every week. She was, you know, for at least 40 weeks a year, she was got to practice her stuff and she got better and better and better. So, I mean, a lot of it is just the breaks you get, but mm -hmm. if, you, but, you know, being a musician, you obviously have to be self-motivated. Um, when you're an actor, you go to classes, you go to workshops, you know, you're, you got, you're in harness that helps, but when you're your own band, the band is the harness, you know, so you have to kind of light your own fire all the time and get out there. And even though I hear what you're saying about playing live, I think that's what would keep us going. Cause when, when you'd start feeling like, Oh my God, this is such a slog and nobody knows we exist. And, is this really good? And you know, who's listening? You'd go out and you'd play. And even if it was the, you know, few people in the audience, inevitably, I mean, almost every time we play, there's somebody who comes up to us and goes, wow, you guys are really good. Or that was so fun. Or, you know, on a good night, it's like, where do we, you know, where are you playing again next? And do you have CDs? We want to buy them. And, you know, so even though you're earning your fans like onesies and twosies at a time, yeah. It's the momentum. And so, you know, hopefully we'll be able to go out and perform again now that uh, hopefully COVID I mean, hopefully is... Hopefully we have a gig on the 30th That's of October. Yeah, if oh, the cool. Delta variant doesn't make L.A. County shut down again. But, um, yeah, no, yeah, we've got a show. and Excellent. Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, there was a, an Imagine Dragons quote. Not that I'm a particularly fan of the band, but there's a one of the guys was quoted as saying, uh, uh, you only, you're only in the music industry if you can't not be in the music industry. Mm. You know, something to the effect that like, right. you got to be crazy to be in it. And uh, if you can't do anything else but that, that's why you're doing it. Because it's that hard. That's, it's that ridiculous right. and, and like thankless, essentially, unless you're just so driven, you can't do anything else. Right. You know, and of or course, for uh, and, and, you know, it's not necessarily thankless, but that's this, that was the sense of the quote, I think. You know? Right, right. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, I've, I think I mentioned this point, but I visited your website and your social media and I've listened to your music. 
the tracks were very, um, the ones that I heard, uh, the 80s dance ones I'm kind of referring to, uh, very smooth, rhythmic, fun, catchy. Um, what was your journey like in developing your skills as songwriters and recording artists? Well, when I was in, in advertising, I was a writer in advertising and I was writing commercials and jingles and, you know, brochures and all that stuff. And I said, well, this is okay. I can do this. And I was working at a big agency named Ogilvy Mather. And I said, hey, I want to take a songwriting class at UCLA Extension. And I said, yeah, go ahead. We'll pay for it. You know, so they paid for it. And uh, I, the teachers, uh, you know, after the end of the class, he says, you know, you really should do this. I mean, you're really good at it. Because he'd won a couple of Oscars as a songwriter and had a few. Say hits. his name. A guy named Al Kasha. And he, uh, he uh, I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to be teaching. An, uh, There's got to be a morning after. He wrote that song. Remember that song? Anyway, uh, but Abby sang it better than that. <laughs> anyway, he's a, he's a sweet man, but he died. And um, I, so I took a much smaller class because those are in the days when everybody wanted to be a songwriter. So his class had like a hundred people in it, you know. And then he said, well, I'm going to have like eight people at my house for, for 10 weeks, you know. And of course, you have to pay for that too. So I got the agency to pay for that. And, uh, and I, you know, he said, you know, you're really good. And he, he helped me get some early collaborators because if you don't have any help, you can flaunt around and just give up. And then I met some other people uh, working at a small record label who turned me on to other people. And I started to meet more and more of the underbelly, which is, you know, where you have to start out, you know, with the independent record labels. And then I would gradually get enough stuff that I could start hitting up publishers uh, with demos and once in a while they take interest and that's how everyone did it in those days mm -hmm. wow. 70s and 80s but then at some point you must have got you got into studio you did your first track and then all of a sudden you're on your third or your fourth and, and they're getting better right sometimes and, <laughs> <laughs> the spiriting thing is that sometimes uh, especially when you don't know what you're doing you can't recapture what you did before if you're using different people at different studio. So you say, oh, wait and a second. And this is pre-digital. Maybe I should just mm. use this people in these in this studio. And then you've, you know, then you get into a little bit of a groove and then the studio closes or you, that guy moves away and you have to, you know, uh, and, you know, sooner or later you build a universe of people that you can get with, but it's, it's, in the in the early days, it's very much um, learn as you go. Uh, but to me, it was always helpful to play my songs for anyone who would listen to them, mm -hmm. whether it be a parakeet or a, a, you know a friend or a friend's mother, you know, and just just what do you think, you know? And even if it's not the kind of music, maybe they'd like it. I mean, some people would like some of my songs just because they were so weird, you know, like Shadow of Hitler, uh, mm -hmm. which actually did get a sync usage on television. And what wow. about your wonderful performance at your singing teacher's recital where you did Monkey Love? That's right. But that led to nothing. Except, well, that's true. Except a very some funny, embarrassed girl. A future sketch idea. Yes. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, I, I remember. I can relate to the uh, playing my songs for anyone who would listen thing. Definitely, when I was in my prime of developing my songwriting skills, whatever friends were open to it, I'd be like, "Hey, you want to hear my new song?" And at that certain point in my early college days, I was writing four or five songs a week. Mm -hmm. So if I got, if I found, I knew which friends would listen, you know, and I invite them over and we'd have coffee and I would just play for a half hour, an hour and uh, get their feedback. And, you know, it, it was that weird thing. Like I got this great gift I want to share, but I realized I'm asking you for a favor, 
even though you're hearing, you're, you're hearing a great song, but I'm still asking right. for a favor, you know? It's, <laughs> it, was it is a, a very thing. awkward uh, thing when said, you're but, starting but out. But John, you know, yeah. we're moving next week, so... Uh, <laughs> Help us move the furniture, right? Yeah, right, right. Or exactly. like, wow, what kind of coffee is this? This is great. <laughs> those are the those are the times when you really like. <laughs> <laughs> is that where you grew up in Brooklyn, and you spent your your life? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I I, I live four doors away from where I grew up, actually. So wow. my mother lives four doors down. I live in Marine Park, Brooklyn, uh, with my you wife and your son. Video? Is she in your video? You yeah, know? she was in my in my recent video. She's in a few of them. She was playing bass in the garden, which we just redid. Yeah, project. no, I thought it was really adorable. I said, I kept looking at her. I said, boy, this woman's got charisma. <laughs> can she really play bass? No, but she uh, she can play accordion and um, she can sing. So so she has some rhythm. So like she was able to at least yeah. kind of mock the rhythm pretty well. And she saw me playing guitar for. 30, uh, almost 30 years now. So, you know, so she has the, an idea. Um, yeah, so uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, this Marine Park, very kind of near quasi suburban neighborhood. Considering it's New York City, it's, it's quite neighborhood like, you know? Yeah. Uh, residential, and um, which is really great. I have a nature trail across the street. Mm. I did spend about a half a year living in Brazil and about two years a little less uh, living in japan mm. so and a few years just across the avenue you know 10 minutes away uh, living in my own apartment but basically brooklyn air this is my home plus living abroad i consider japan a second home and nice. brazil a third home you know and brooklyn uh, has become so intensely hip i know the weirdest thing <laughs> Well, gentrification you know. is hitting LA pretty hard too. So yeah, I could bet. Yeah, I mean, we were just in down. My son's going to a Japanese school for a Saturday class. Uh, he's six, by the way, and um, my wife's Japanese. We're John and Yoko. I see. Oh wow, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, yeah. and uh, <laughs> his name is Kai. He's not uh, Sean or anything like that. <laughs> but um, or so you? yeah. We're, yeah, we're Julian. So we're driving downtown, and uh, I used to, always used to go downtown for various things, and I haven't been there so much lately. But now it's just so me metropolitan. It's it's you might as well be in, in Lower Manhattan. It, it's that you, huge buildings, so much traffic. You can't make a left turn anywhere on certain places. You know, boy, I don't I don't like it that much. But uh, you know, there goes your Aussie and Harriet. Mm -hmm. Ozzy and Harriet? You don't know that reference. Uh, they're uh, no. I'm really showing my age. They're a sitcom pair that were, I think he was a ba big band guy. Was, Ricky Nelson's Ricky Nelson, parents. He was on the show. Do you remember Ricky Nelson ever? It's probably even. Yeah, I know the name. Went to the garden party. Da -da 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 -da. Anyway, Ricky Nelson was a, was kind of like. A Heart pop star of the, the 50s, of the late 50s, early, early 60s. 60s. My older sisters were gaga over him. And, it, he, you oh, know, yeah. they, he came from a, a family that had a sitcom. It was called Ozzy and Harriet. And it was a... a tr tr White picket fence, yeah, dad it, goes to work, mom... You know. I think it was set in Los Angeles. Probably. And as most and they're raising, were, you know, two teenage boys. They only they didn't have a girl. Yeah, it was and, David and, and Ricky. Right. And they were... Their real sons were on the show, so it was like a showbiz family was, doing an enactment of their life with sort of a sweet '50s sensibility, you know, like a father who knows best. It was, it was, it was more like Lucy, have, Lucy and Desi without the slapstick. And mm -hmm. then they'd have music at the end because Ricky always played guitar. And, and and Ozzy was a big band guy who was cute, so he became like a sitcom act. But the reference just meant that your kind of picket fence, the Brooklyn you knew growing up has now morphed into a more of a urban sophisticate, boho sophisticate. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, gentrified well, yeah, as you said. I, I, I would say some of the Brooklyn people that I've met are, um, they, they don't consider themselves like 
oh, we're not Manhattan. You know, we're like more easygoing, Are more sure? more Odi and granola y and is that so? I don't yeah, know. I'd say so. Yeah, Brooklyn Heights. What, what do I know? But I mean, I would say for the Brooklyn I grew up with, I was born in 1980. You know, I grew up with my, my neighborhood was pretty Irish and Italian growing up. And there was still racism around here, you know, unfortunately. But uh, and a thick Brooklyn accent. When I listened to recordings of myself as a teenager, my accent was very thick. It's funny. Uh, I thought you were from Boston when I first heard I thought you were from Italy. Speak. <laughs> Italy? <laughs> Oh no! It just all the Italians. I live around so many Italians when I grow up. You know? maybe so. so maybe I hey. He looks know, so I have a little bit of that. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, yeah, I've gotten Boston a few times, only from West Coasters. No oh, one on the East Coast would think I'm from Boston, but West Coast might. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, believe me, it's much more tame now. I used to talk much, much more like this from Brooklyn. It's, you know, you got a certain lingo to it. It's hard to tell. You know what, what this guy's saying. <laughs> a little bit more like that yeah like i don't Chaz, talk like Chaz Palm, palmateri do you know who Chaz palmateri is no he's a he wrote a book uh, he wrote the bronx oh tale. the bronx tale sorry wrong wrong borough <gasps> bronx no way yeah yeah bronx and brooklyn <laughs> we we always like you know Battle the, the idea is yeah brooklyn tells we think bronx is super dangerous and yeah. and bronx is you know brooklyn's the most dangerous place and all that oh wow and what about yeah. queen and Queens is just, you know. It's very gay. It's just whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah. But Brooklyn, you know, Brooklyn's the hot spot. There's no doubt about it. Even more than Manhattan, Brooklyn's the place that you go anywhere in the world. People know New York City and they know Brooklyn. Uh, They're naming their children after Brooklyn too. Yeah. <laughs> go figure. Yeah. Yeah, um, I don't mind the gentrification much in the sense that it is safer now uh, on the whole than when I grew up, you know, and it's a lot more uh, understanding, you know, a lot, well, I would say a lot less racist, at least more on the surface. More tolerant of the view. Yeah, a lot more tolerant, integrated. It, it, that New York City always was, because it, it, right. it had to be, but, um, but now it really is more visible, like going to the park, my son will play with Russians and people of this religion and that Chinese and and whatever background and they all just play together, they fight together, they get along together, and they go home and everything's yeah. fine, you know. And that brings probably the parents together a little bit more too. You're less suspicious because you're looking after the welfare of your own kid, and if your kid likes that kid, and you know you're getting to know that kid's parents. No, you're I think so. I think so. Oh. Yeah, I mean, of course, that could also not happen too. I mean, there's a lot of fear in the air these days too but um true. that's true. It, it's it's more it's a different type of fear you know i guess it's more like fear of getting sick than than uh, uh than distrust of the different nationality uh yeah i don't know i see in the parks it, it's pretty encouraging what i'm seeing when yeah. i take my son to the parks I, we go to all sorts of parks nice yeah people seem to get along pretty well here great that's great you know john uh on every Sunday night, on midnight, at midnight, we're shown on the MNN, which is the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. We right? have a half, of, well, 20 minute do you know, variety show. Do, do you know that network? It's a, it's a internet and cable uh, access. Um, it's public access. Yeah, public access that, I mean, uh, you can watch it on internet or if you actually live in Manhattan or some of the around surrounding boroughs, you can watch it on cable. That's cool. So MNN, you said? MNN, Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Okay, cool. And, and what's the show? I'll put in the show notes. Meet the Tyrants in Therapy. Mm -hmm. And it's on Lifestyle Channel 2. There's, I think they have five channels on there. And there's some interesting stuff on there. It's real kind of, it's gotten better. It's um, very street, but you know, it's public access. Yeah, so. and it's very, mm -hmm. very, uh, it's I, fun. You would, you might think it's more in Manhattan. I can't tell between New York and Manhattan. I don't know it well enough, but um, you know, some of it's really cool and some of it is, oh my God, it's awful. 
Um, but just that's like a, it is in L.A. It yes, was. Yes, yes, or just like regular television is too. Well, I wouldn't go mm -hmm. that far. Well, some, I mean, some regular television would just be dull and lame, but. I'm talking about the production values on public access. It's getting the, better because people are taking it into their own hands. That's true. They've got better, t better and, phones. Uh, and but we, you know, it's kind of like the sketch comedy mixed with music that we do on there. Cool. So there are half hour shows and, um, you know, if you've got nothing else to do at midnight, tune in. I'll send you a link. <laughs> on Sunday. Cool. That's cool. Um, uh, yeah, so speaking of that, and my next question is, I've also seen, you know, your various skit style videos that have a quirky and comedic touch. Those are the words that came to mind. Can you tell us a little bit about how humor and skits fit into how you, who and how you show up in the world, who you are? And I know you mentioned it, how you incorporate into the live show, but, but there's more to it, right? Because you're doing this behind the scenes camera and you're thinking it out. How does that fit into your creative uh, well, output we started kind of doing it accidentally i mean even though my father's a comedy writer i grew up second generation hollywood and you know comedy was prized in my family if you could get a laugh or be entertained that was you know got family love for that um but aside from that we actually discovered you know we were we wanted to get a booker and we needed video and that gets expensive hiring a videographer and you know so we i realized that we had a public access studio down the street from us and called and they said yeah you come in and you do a one night thing and they make you a producer and they teach you the rules and the regulations and so i said all right let's just go so we went and um i think the first session we did we did some music but also we wrote a little sketch i think it was about dream you know or i had a dream you know just us looking at the camera and and um and then we realized oh wow this is fun and it's easy and it doesn't cost anything and so then we started developing and writing a little bit more ambitiously we got a host who we wrote these very crazy grandiloquent introductions as if it was like a takeoff on masterpiece theater like alistair cook and, you know, but he would be comparing us to the myth of Sisyphus and, you know, making all these grandiose statements. And then we'd come on and do a little more low comedy. And then we'd sing a song that would be more like, oh, wow, that's pretty thought provoking. So we it was kind of this roller coaster of entertainment. And, um, and it just developed from there. So suddenly we had this body of sketches. And it was really, I think, from doing that that we started integrating more of the sketches into our live show. Because way back in the beginning, we would do a lot of sound effects and we would take snippets from movies and have famous actors say, you know, we had like Clark Gable, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. You know, we'd, that would like be a segue between songs. So it was very, it was even more surreal because we weren't even talking to the audience. We were singing live, but, but then we started developing characters relating to each other and that came from doing those sketches at public access and so. then we even got delusions of adequacy and we realized there was like eight or so studios we could work at throughout the city and instead of like doing a show which is what most people did in two hours and they give you edited tape at the end and you put that show on we said wait a second we'll we'll take that and we'll edit that in the computer. We'll take two. We'll take each footages. two hours. Yeah, we we booked two hours at because it was L.A. City. And two pieces. Yeah. And um, so so our shows got more and more elaborate and more like traditional television shows, like kind of variety comedy shows. Uh, except we were playing most of the parts. But then uh, we went to something that was an offshoot of a New York thing called the Directors Lab West. And we I met think it started at Lincoln Center, right. so it was a real New York. So we, we met a lot of directors, and they helped us meet more actors. And so we expanded our uh, repertoire and our, and our resources. And some of the shows actually, are I, I think, are really, really good. And others were just flights of fantasy that, well, hit and miss. that ran out of gas sometimes but <laughs> maybe there was a good idea in there but the execution was not 
totally there. It, the execution was always bad because no matter <laughs> how I'd planned, they'd find a way to fuck it up. And uh, well, the you have of, to you have to edit it around, and it was the people who are were the camera people and the lighting people. I mean, they were often volunteers. They were amateurs. You know, they didn't. Mm -hmm. Some of them were good. Some were good. Some weren't. Some but, would be playing games on their cell phone while they were shooting. And, yeah, it was like, wait, you're supposed <coughs> to be going to that camera. And he's busy. Yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, um, it's it was potluck, but we we made the most of it. Yeah, we made twenty eight shows. And uh, they're in rotation in Manhattan, and on the all, MNN network, yeah, and all over the world actually. If you, if anyone wants to watch them in Brazil, that's true. We have clips um, on YouTube, you know, excerpts. And so mm -hmm. if you go to our YouTube page, and we can give you that link, people can check it out. Yeah, whatever links you share with me uh, in an email, they'll be in the show notes so people can go exploring for the tyrants and therapy in various, all well, the various ways you show up. Um, yeah, but I have to admit, I definitely had fun going through those, uh, those skit type things. I, I like that when I was in, um, I mean, I like skit shows when I was younger and in high school, we, my friends and I did our own home movies with, you know, just like this early video camera that one person had, you know. And uh, yeah, the skits we would do and very raw, bare bones stuff. But um, so I could see, I could appreciate what you've done. I know how much work it takes to, to yeah. think it up and then execute it. And I like the sound editing. Uh, is that you, Michael, that you're doing mostly? Pretty much. Yeah, that, that really puts me in an interesting space that kind of like active, I don't know if it's dance music, it's electronic music, I guess. And sometimes it's just like a raw guitar in there which is the guitar says something. It's funny, like you, the guitar will make it seem awkward. Or, I, I don't know how you came up with that, but it's very cool. Um, I wonder which song you're talking about. Um, like even even the one I just saw, the the untitled one, um, but he, a few of them, there'll be like something weird will be said and then there'll be like this guitar chord. Right, that's like a yeah. punctuation. Like. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and that it'll just make you like, I, I, I see the variety show coming through, you know, I, I, even though I didn't watch much of that, those early ones, 50s, 60s, I've seen whatever remnants of that existed in, in the era that I watched TV and uh, it's familiar, but, but pretty new at the same time, you know? Cool. Thank you. So, yeah. And you create a, a unique world, which is in, in all its bizarreness, it's also, um, What's the word? Uh, it's consistent, right? Mm. Well, Abby, so, one of her one of her inspirations, at least stylistically and uh, image wise, graphically, uh, is Pee Wee's Playhouse. Ah, okay. Uh, but not as nonsensical as that. I think we try to keep it more focused on. Well, with the drawings and also the characters that we were playing. There's, you know, one of my I mean, essentially, the backstory that we kind of backed into was that we were two mental patients that were committed to a Brazilian mental hospital by our parents. And my problem was I had multiple personalities. And Michael's was that he was had delusions of grandiosity. And so we meet in the, you know, rec room there and hit it off. I think the director of the institute puts us together. And we start writing poems and songs, and then he says, well, you should play at the sanator sanitarium's um, talent show. And so we play, and we go over really big, and who, who should be in the audience but Maurizio Saperstein, who is a big agent. And he's, of course, at the mental hospital visiting his third wife. And so he decides to book us on a tour of Latin America's finest mental hospitals. And when we go over so well, we think we're cured. So we escape and come to L.A. to pursue our music career. But our family is so rich that rather than have us come home and be with them, they say, why don't you just stay there? And they support us in this big mansion. As long as we Angeles. check in to have therapy with our, brain, our Buenos Aires psychiatrist. I told this to, the, to a bartender at a really fancy restaurant uh, hotel one time. And he says, is this really true? <laughs> Yeah, the details are so elaborate and so off the wall that like, I, when I saw it, I'm like, I wonder if this is like a reenactment of how they really... <laughs> you 
<laughs> and to top it all off, we had a meeting once with a former boss of mine. He said, let's meet at the Polo Lounge, world famous Polo Lounge at the Beverly Hills Hotel, right on Sunset Boulevard in the middle of Beverly Hills, gorgeous place. And so we're walking with him, you know, and he was one of these bosses who, you know, kind of indulged me. Oh, yeah, you're an artist, you're a musician, you're an actor, yeah. <laughs> and so we walk in and the maitre d' there stops and he looks at the three officers and he says, the tyrants in therapy. Because it turns out he was he was an Afghani, a guy who was the maitre d' at the polo lounge. He was a big fan of our show. He watched public access TV, who knew? And so my boss like was like, gobsmack <laughs> you know that the the maitre d at the polo lounge who usually gets tipped 50 bucks to get a good seat you know is no is like fawning over us so he you know rolled out the red carpet and gave us a nice table and all of that so that was one of those moments where it's like wow we've arrived <laughs> yes <laughs> that's great yeah that, that's funny I, i've had a few few moments of feeling like i've arrived that uh was enough for me to say, okay, I got, I got a taste. Yeah. One, one time, uh, I think we, I was with my band, one of my, my last band, maybe 2005. We were in. Was your band uh, called? It was called Level Six, and we were, we've since kind of disappeared in terms of any internet presence. You could find some songs, but it was just like this split that wasn't so pleasant. Mm -hmm. So there's no good reason to let the music live on and we did we didn't have anything that was established out there that couldn't be taken back you know mm. uh but all, all my stuff is is out there as much as i can I'm, I, have, I have tons of my own stuff and even my any rock bands i was in before that level six uh, i've made it put on my public archives so that could be heard but um mm. yeah this band not really i guess it wasn't really my band you know uh anyway we, we went we went to we were recording in weed california which is near mount shasta wow. and weed california actually incidentally has a high school called buttsville high school i'm not kidding <laughs> buttsville high school is in weed, california <laughs> okay anyway there uh, we went out to eat now it's like f these five of us four guys with this cool heavy metal hard rock look from from the 2000s and this really big heavy set guy with a lot of tattoos, who was not our bodyguard. He was our opening act comedian, believe it or not. So we, there's Brooklyn guys in this Northern California. We go to a restaurant. Our producer is taking us out to eat or something. And a bunch of people see us walking in. And I guess we look like someone. And they ask for our autographs and we're <laughs> signing autographs. You know, and it's like, I'm sure they didn't know who we were. Yeah. You know, I, I think it would be possible. Maybe not. But, Maybe they were at your show. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. But then there was another time in uh, in New Jersey, we opened up for the Misfits, like the legendary punk band the Misfits. And uh, I wore a crown of thorns in those days. I was like my theatrics. I had a Jesus look, the beard, the long hair, and I wore a crown of thorns and would like do my mascara. And then uh, anyway, afterwards, um, it was played to a pretty big audience, several hundred. Uh, one a bunch of girls stopped us and said, hey, you know, sign our breasts. So a few of us got a chance to do that. And they didn't know who we were, but they wanted us to sign. And uh, so we couldn't say no. And then uh, one girl stole my crown of thorns oh. and she gave me her number and she wouldn't give it back. So I actually had to drive <laughs> to Jersey the next week to get it. Oh my God, what a story. <laughs> that's a riot. But So that, yeah, that's name part of, of the, the experiences. Mary was her name Mary Magdalene? <laughs> no, I actually, you know, I don't know her name, but I do remember the, the story and I will include that snippet in my autobiography uh, because it's just, it's just Bizarre. interesting. It's yeah. a very great image. <laughs> you having your crown of thorns taken. Yeah, and maybe after that, I started to get the idea that I should leave the crown of thorns alone, but I did wear it for a while. Why did you go to Weed, California to record? So there's uh, something called a, you may be familiar with it, called a spec deal, which is this idea that, uh, pr uh, for the sake of anyone who doesn't know who's listening, um, this idea that producer with a name is going to take a band and uh, basically do uh, 
a, a demo back it was 2005 so demos were still relevant and you do a demo that you're going to shop to labels and she would shop to her people because she had connections this was sylvia massey she did a lot of big bands um oh, yeah, I know that sylvia name. massey shitty anyway uh tools one band she worked with uh-huh. joe Cetriani. anyway she um if she thought it was great she would show it to her people and then she would have like this connection and somehow get percentage if, if she passed us along. And uh, also we would get a discount for the recording by because we were on spec. So that, that was the idea. So we, we paid quite a bit, but it was a lot less than her regular fee because she sort of believed in what we were doing or at least sort of our potential. So that's, and her studio was there. Oh. That's, what we were, that's why we're in Weed, California instead of LA, you know, yeah. or something. But uh, yeah, we're from Brooklyn, so if we could have got a spec deal here, we would have. But yeah. that's where it was offered. You know? So what happened to the product? Uh, I think that can be found somewhere online. Those four songs. Uh, it was a very good recording. Um, sounds really burning, really powerful, and raw and raunchy. But uh, I don't know. We were a bunch of slackers. I don't know what it was, but uh, we lost our steam after that. I thought it was great, but the other guys in the band thought it was too polished. You know, it wasn't the raw sound that embodied who we were. I have no idea who we were or who we were supposed to be. You know, I just wanted to make good music and work. But there was a lot of opinions. And at a certain point, the guys, some of the guys started to kind of hate each other, a lot of fighting. And then uh, one, this like older guy, friend of ours who ran a studio locally, saw us one night and I had a one-on-one with him. He's like, John, your bands doesn't look like it's, uh, it's not going anywhere. I haven't seen you guys in a year or two and you don't even sound any better. And you don't, you're not playing gigs. What's going on? And I mm-hmm. kind of dawned on me that he, he, he even recommended, you know, uh, it's a dying animal. You might as well cut your losses. And, and he had no interest in like seeing us, our demise. He just saw that as a friend, it would be better if I just recognized what was happening and moved on. And that's what I did, and it wasn't a pretty breakup, but I, I'm in I'm I'm in good stead with all those guys still. Good. Yeah. Sometimes it takes something like that, an outside force, to uh, to tell you something that you you can't see or you won't see, and um, I mean that's I I try to get people uh, with experience to listen at all times even in the early stages of stuff, you know. Yeah. You tell got to listen to what you're yeah, recording. What, what and, yeah, doing, what I'm yeah, doing, or to come see us. I mean, and everyone likes the, the tyrants when they see us. Um, and, you know, it's like, I always think that if you just come up with a good beat and a couple of chords and, and, and something to say, uh, that could be the kind of song that people want to hear over and over again. And by the time you spent your two or three thousand dollars on making a record out of it, you know, per track, uh, I mean, that's what I predicate all that stuff on. Um, but you know, ninety percent of the stuff in music doesn't make it, and the ten percent that does pays for everything else in terms of the business. In terms of a label. No, in terms of the music business. I mean, ninety percent of all the release releases uh, on 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 commercial re- record labels don't. Right. Make. And and it's mm-hmm. probably the same thing in in the in the world of CD Baby these days. You know where you know mm-hmm. anybody can put out a new thing. Did you go to the the, the conference in twenty nineteen? Yes. Yeah, I was there in I person. You there? You guys were there? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, there was like like ten thousand people. We were, yeah, we were there. yeah, there's a lot of people. Of, yeah, that was fun. That was a fun one. It was a really fun. I had a great vibe. Very upbeat, enthusiastic. Lots we, of good speakers. We did a set there. We we went to one of those clubs and you threw your 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 card in there and it was, you know how hot it was. It was a was. cheer up, Charlie's. Remember yeah. that? Yes, yeah, so I performed there on the on the Sunday night, the last night. Oh, you I did. did. I, was the, I was the first one to perform that night. Oh, we weren't there that night. I think we were there Saturday night. All right. Yeah. It was a cool spot. 
Yeah, it was. Yeah. It had, yeah. But you're right. The weather was uh, beastly. <laughs> yeah, Austin in the summer. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I'm, I bought my ticket for next year, which is supposed to be in Austin, and yeah. you know, let's uh, knock on wood that everything will be possible in terms yeah. of flying and better be stuff like that. Yeah, it, it was fun. I do like uh, I, I really like being amongst fellow independent musicians. You know, I really feel like we have this kindred spirit. Like I felt I was like I went to music college, so I felt like oh, I'm back in college, music college, only that much better because we're like interested in actually doing the work ourselves and it was all the classes that i kind of was more curious about not just music history and and all that term mm -hmm. which i want to learn but there was you know music college there was nothing about the business at least mm -hmm. not when i was there so to hear about what school did you go to uh brooklyn college conservatory of music ah okay it, you know it's it's a good it's a good one uh a lot of people from all over yeah. the world come there believe it or not yeah no but um i've heard of it that's terrible that they don't um teach business something about the business except i think it's kind of like like liberal arts at a, at a other college is they don't think about that like you know what are you going to do with an english major mm -hmm. well a conservatory is supposed to be you're working on your instrument or your art, you know, whether you're an artist or a musician, I think more than, yeah, this is how you go about getting an agent. This is what a distribution deal looks like. And this is what this lingo means and what that lingo means. I mean, yeah, I think you're right. It should just be part of the curriculum. Well, but most people who go to conservatories are classical musicians, aren't they, for the most part? Yeah, classical and jazz. It's just that what what about us what about the people who are more into rock and roll or, mm -hmm. or sort of like the uh, commercial or or even folk or whatever just other genres that are not so sort of like uh I think they think they're, they're or like whatever. people's music you know you're supposed to learn it on the street and, and i mean largely that happens i guess did you know that paul mccartney in in liverpool has a, a, a college that teaches songwriting and it's a music school. Yeah, it's a music school. Oh, yeah. One of our collaborators went to that. That's great. Is yeah, that doesn't surprise me. I mean, yeah. I know they exist now. I, I was I taught in one in a, some one of them a program like that uh, two years ago in honor of my friend who passed away. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I know that my uh, one of my former students actually went to an NYU program that mm -hmm. actually teaches you all about the business and how to record. Mm -hmm. and exactly. So they're, they're they're existing now. They're they're popping right. up. I think becoming more of a accepted yeah. uh, curricula right but when i was there what, what i would i was a very traditional conservatory which was good because i learned uh how to compose in various styles and yeah. i was a com composition major and i met a lot of musicians who Did appeared you... on my music on my second album and stuff like that nice so you play guitar but do you also play piano or another instrument yeah primarily guitar player uh i'm a singer um bass player drummer uh i do play piano i, I can compose on piano mm -hmm. i tend to compose on guitar or just mm -hmm. like with the manuscript paper you know mm -hmm. without necessarily playing piano but um i've written a lot of piano pieces and jazz ensemble pieces and yeah quite a number of different diverse things i composed music to two uh children's musicals nice scored and fully scored and everything do you also um, do programming, sequencing? Not, not exactly. Yeah. No, not exactly. Play, play the instrument. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I would no. When I when I do recording, I'm happy to work in MIDI and do it without actually playing it, and then move things around. Right. Uh, but I would generally. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't even I don't do it so much nowadays, so I don't really have like a thing that I do. That's true. But, You're in a different. Yeah, different oh. mode. Yeah. But when I was in college and right after I was doing just a lot on finale. So, you know, essentially be typing music standard mm -hmm. notation into a score and then each uh, instrument, I would choose MIDI appropriate MIDI for it. And then I would blend the sounds like that instead of like in, in like a, a, a door instead of like your traditional music studio recording software like GarageBand, 
mm -hmm. I, would, I would do it in finale. Um, I gotcha. Now, now I'm much more using GarageBand and stuff, and I wouldn't use the score style, although whatever, it's just a different era that I'm in, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I learned a lot and uh, no regrets. Um, but uh, yeah, like I said, the conservatory didn't exactly prepare me to have a career of any sorts outside of teaching, really, you know, mm -hmm. or being a composer, who knows where, <laughs> you know, who knows where, in like a classical setting, which, or in like a, a collegiate setting. I don't know, sometimes I get the feeling that college mainly teaches people to have a job in college, you know. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, sometimes I got that feeling. Well, somebody has to keep the academy alive. Right. The treasure trove of scholarship that's centuries before us has established. Right. It's not me, but I'm glad some people are doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a great conversation. If you have a few more minutes, I have a couple more questions for you. Sure. All right. Um, so how have your tastes and perspectives relating to music shifted and evolved over the years? your taste and perspective? God, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, I would say mine, you know, I also, this kind of leads to maybe another conversation you wanted to have about spirituality, but I, um, a few years ago, became a certified breathwork facilitator because I found it to be an incredibly healing modality. So I put together, and I do monthly breath circles in my home studio with people breathing. It's like a guided meditation but with a certain kind of pranayama breathing pattern. So I put together um, playlists for that, which is very, uh, you know, they're very, they're, they're, they're inviting us, they're inviting the people in the circle to relax, to stop the monkey mind, to just start having an experience of opening their hearts and moving stuck energy out of their bodies. So I've been discovering a lot of um, music that's much, softer, um, less lyrically oriented, more like, um, I don't know, some of the artists that I've come across that I've never really been exposed to, but I just like because it has a kind of hypnotic, soothing quality. So I think that having kind of put my toe into those waters, um, I really like that kind of music. It hasn't found its way quite into the music we're writing. Um, but I hope that it begins to. It, it, in, in subject matter, it has. We have a great song. I, I think it's great that we're working on called Healing Time, um, but it's really more like a blues number. So I've noticed that music in general has become a little more like the veil is lifting. It's kind of more ethereal in some ways. And yet there's the good old train rock and roll beat that I love too. I discovered a band called Manskin recently that did a very cool kind of R&B, just irresistible thing. You want to hear it again the minute it's over kind of song. Mm -hmm. wow. So that's speaking for me. Michael probably has his different take. Um, cool. What was the question again? Uh, how have your tastes and perspectives relating to music shifted and evolved over the years? Um, when I first started, um, I only liked the kind of music of that time that I was starting out in. So, you know, like glitter rock and hard rock and, you know, folk pop and stuff like that. And anything before that was crap. And, um, God, you and, were hard. No, well, I was. I mean, I, I hated that music. What As music? A, what you mean, like Anything. your parents' music? Yeah, or? and 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 you know, oh my God, Lawrence Welk, forget about it. <laughs> and then when I started to 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 work with with good musicians, I went back. You know, I'd be waiting for Abby to get ready, and we'd be going out like in the nineties. And oh my God, look, there's some Lawrence Welk. God, I'm gonna watch this. Oh, stupid. And I listened to it. I said, you know. Everything about that is schmaltzy, but I'd love to have those guys play some of some horn parts on my stuff because you know <laughs> they really can play. I wouldn't want them to play like the champagne music of schmaltzy Lawrence Welk, but you could utilize that talent 
to another aim, and so I, I became more open mm -hmm. um, to other to other things because I realized how really good those people were, and that was the music of their times. I mean, um, big band music was the rock and roll of of the war generation. You know, mm -hmm. people, yeah. that's why they built places like the Palladium and stuff like that, and. Big dance halls. Big dance halls that could have 7,000 people because they drew crowds of 7,000 people who wanted to go out and dance to Benny Goodman and, you know, Count Basie and whoever else was yeah. playing. Mm -hmm. And um, I became much more eclectic. And then I started to say, well, we, you know, we can bring some of those elements into our music instead of being just so, you know, three chord and a cloud of dust. Um, we could actually utilize some of those things. So, you know, we've, we've, let's see, what songs have we used that on? Um, like on the Ballad of the Tyrants in Therapy is kind of like a klezmer uh, influence. And uh, we did an adaptation of Je Tem, which is a song by Serge Gonsberg, French song, which is almost kind of like a, a, a novelty record from the 50s and um, some of our songs have orchestral flourishes in them and you know because we have a, a much wider palette now because of we work with some really good music programmers so you know if a lot of them work in television and film. Some of them are composed yeah they're yeah. composers they're writing film and so TV. if we say oh we want some Berlioz Oh, okay, you know, and they mm -hmm. can do that stuff. Um, so it's, you know, our palette has gotten as vivid as our imagination, which I think is a good thing because I know a lot of people who are just still doing the same thing as as they were when they were starting out. And, doing yet, and yet, you know, you mentioned before about the eclecticism that it's hard to market because of, we do have so many, um, we do like so many kinds of music. And I mean, it's still filtered through our sensibility. So that's the common denominator. But, you know, we'll do a country song, like I Hate the Zodiac is a country song. It's a country novelty song. But In the Shadow of Hitler, which is an anti-fascist waltz, is a, a waltz. Um, you know, we have rock and roll, we have punk, we have love songs. So it's it's not as if any genre is off, off the off table, limits, yes. even jazz, you know, we had jazzy elements and it, a lot of it is what, you know, our collaborators bring, you know, we'll might have be working with a, like we have a guitar player friend who's very into jazz, kind of this light jazzy thing. And we've written some interesting stuff with him. Sex is back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sex is back is kind of a bluesy thing. Right? Blues jazz. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's, uh, yeah. well, it's, this is, this is what we do. I'm reminded of one other band that I could think of that uh, is kind of undefinable in terms of like, kind of, they're pretty schizoid stylistically, like they yeah. have like five styles, genres in one song. They're called Mr. Bungle. If, then, if you have any curiosity, I've check them out. Bungle? Are they English? Uh, the singer, Mike Patton, is American. He's from, he was also sang with Faith No More, but they're really like a mind, uh, mind warp. Um, I don't like them, but I could definitely appreciate the ridiculous level of musical skill that they have. Mm. Um, there's nothing soothing about it, <laughs> you know, because it's just so here and there. But whatever genre they're in, they're fully in it, you know. Then they go to the wow. next genre. Okay, um, Mr. Bungle. Sometimes, you know, so, what I what I find is if there's too much artistic schizophrenia in a program. And it's not done right. It becomes so taxing that people can it's respect irritating. it, but they don't really like it. Yeah. You know? Right. Right. Yeah. It's hard to, because you're kind of like playing with people's uh, emotions uh, maybe yes. too much, maybe. Right? Yes. Well, there's a band called Sparks. I don't know if you ever heard of them. And no. they they have they've they've done thirty records since the seventies and. They just made a documentary about them, and also there's a feature film 
called Annette, which is a musical they wrote. And and Adam Driver and Mar that's Marion right. Cotillard. Yeah, and it's in got it. some big movie stars in it. And we tried watching it, and it was so annoying because it was so screamingly brilliant in every little thing. There was no humanity that was allowed to come into it. And hmm. it was so at a distance. And it was. It's sort of, you know, there's also a style of singing that I kind of put in the same bucket where it's like somebody has such technical skill and they're just all over the place with their voice that it's like just it's like show off music like I can do this I can do this and watch this and what's this and it's sort of like even and people like go crazy for it but I just find it so much about the ego of the singer rather than telling mm -hmm. me a story taking me on a journey using the voice to caress or yeah, to point out or to connect keeping it simple it's more like you know you're in some kind of vocal lesson and somebody's showing you what their range is and it's very annoying it's like a turnoff something shuts down in me i think when i when i sense the ego like and it's an insecurity it's like i can do so much and you know see you know you want the affirmation of just your technical skill but there's that whole kind of more subtle artistic layer that you need to inject into something so that people can really embrace it and feel embraced by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think I could, uh, I could sense what you're talking about. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a certain style of singing like with the kind of, uh, the sort of commercial, what's the word? Uh, American Idols, sort yeah, of, right. sort of, you know, Everything vibe. is like performed at such a penultimate level that, yeah. It has no dynamics because it's right. always going towards the high notes all the time and it becomes exhausting. And that's not the thing of true artistry. That's this thing that's kind of like getting a job at a theme park and doing covers all the time of other people's stuff. And, you know, it's... Yeah, it doesn't sit too well with me. Uh, it never appealed to me. A lot of people loved it and friends would tell me, you should do American Idol, go for it, you know, <laughs> you could sing. I'm, I was like, I don't think that that's really would be too great for me Where or, I for the, or for the people in the audience when they hear me. Uh, I'd be too ordinary, maybe. Did you see um, that Will Ferrell film called Eurovision? No. That's a spoof of, um, there's a big talent show in Europe called Eurovision and I, the most famous person that ever won was Ava. Mm. And um, anyway, it's 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 like last year. You can see it on Netflix. That's Michael's movie suggestion. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> we'll get to that. Right. <laughs> it's, um, it's absurd. So, if you haven't said it yet, uh, what? Uh, oh yeah, can you speak to your longevity? What were some of the key factors in your sticking together? As the tyrants of therapy, tyrants in therapy over the course of decades now. I think when one of us has been discouraged, the other one's been there to boy, boy the other one up. You know, when it's like, why are we doing this? You know, we have to rehearse again, or the record came out, it really didn't do anything. There's, you know, there's we remind each other why we're doing it, and. Um, to get back on the horse and explore other avenues. And I think also, as I mentioned before, going out and playing live and realizing, you know, just because you're bored with what you've been doing and it's, you put it out there and it's kind of like not done what you would hoped it was going to do. Other people are hearing it for the first time and they're responding and they're connecting with it and Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's kind of gratifying too. like, okay, we're, we're, we're definitely cutting our own path here through the music business or the entertainment business or whatever you want to call it. But you, you have to be true to it. You have to nurture it. And it's also been a really big spiritual lesson for me to just keep loving myself and loving what I'm doing, even when it's not great, just to keep, it's like the momentum of the positive, keeping the momentum of the positive, because it's easy for anybody to step in and go, oh, this is crap, and why am I doing, you know, get beating. It's sort of like feeling safe by sinking to the bottom of the ocean instead of, like, okay, I'm not really feeling it, but I, I'm going to keep 
providing wings, wind under the wings. And so I know Michael's done that for me when I've been really in the, you know, having the blues about stuff. And I've done that with him too. But we've been lucky that we've, since the beginning of, at least when we started recording, we've always been able to sell records uh, to a greater or lesser extent. And, uh, you know, and have labels want to ask, you know, buy another and thing. We're on compilations and, and we have a fan, you know, we have, you know, a very loyal fan base, mostly for our dance stuff. And um, the frustration for us is trying to expand and integrate that beyond, which thanks to social media, the people who like us are more open to liking some of the more uh, strange stuff even though they don't speak English and a lot of that is predicated on understanding English, but they like us and they like mostly Abby um, because she's the, uh, most of the dance stuff, she's sung all the, the lead on it. Well, yeah, that's the commercial dance stuff. Yeah. And um, so. But you're I, the producer and yeah, no, it's often true. the writer. I mean, to me, the, the most validating, we have a song called too Tough to Cry, which is by and large our biggest hit around the world. And there's a line in it called, happiness is a hybrid trick, love and pain and the whole damn thing. And after one of the gigs, one time someone came up and says, what is a hybrid trick? <laughs> no, no, you said, what does hybrid mean? Yeah, and um, you know, just the fact that someone had puzzled that out and <laughs> it brought, it warmed the cockles of this English major's heart. Right. It made me want to be an English colonel. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, you know, we've, we've gotten enough strokes that, that actually it's like really bad heroin, you know. It's just like, it makes you kind of buzzed and then keeps you hooked. <laughs> so, uh, A lot of drug, re drug references, my dear. I guess we better get high pretty soon. <laughs> I, you I hope there's no one out there who's an anti-drug crusader. But. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I don't think uh, my audience would be too heavily, <laughs> heavily anti-drug. Maybe neither here nor there. Maybe a little bit. Who knows? Maybe a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm semi straight edge in my uh, appearance, perhaps. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, do each of you have? Um, uh, separately or together have a spiritual philosophy that guides and informs what you do and how you live? Uh, everything is energy and the vibration you put out is the reality you're creating. Everything that you already see around you is happened already. It's manifested. But if you're trying to create your reality going forward, you have to sort of tune your vibration to what gives you what makes you feel good. I think once, once you're in tune, then you know you're on your right path and good things follow. So that's something I've come to recently. That's basically the philosophy of anybody knows of Abraham, Esther and Abraham Hicks. I've tried it, it works, but I also do breath work a lot. That's a lot of the healing modalities that I have tried and used since I've been on a spiritual path since probably college, from astrology to tarot to conventional therapy to all kinds of, you know, forms of Buddhism. Um, I've found that the breath work is the fastest uh, way to stop monkey mind and get centered and really open your heart and cleanse the energy out of your system. So those, those two things I would say are kind of my go-to practices. I so two things being breath work and the other one? And the other is, I guess, um, thinking about energy, which is related to breath work, thinking about everything is vibration. And therefore, if you're keeping your vibration in a good way, that is the energy that you're creating around you that manifests as experience, as people, as opportunities, as conversations, as, you know, just so that you can keep getting closer and closer and closer to your true north because we all have one but it's usually buried over with a lot of conditioning and even ancestral trauma 
and what you've learned from people and you know we learn to edit ourselves and paint ourselves into our own little boxes and to realize that uh, there's a lot more you can create if you're willing to dissolve some of those <clears throat> beliefs which are just thought forms that are habitual mm -hmm. yeah awesome i'm reminded of um i listened to uh talk by Lori Ladd yesterday. I'm familiar with Lori Ladd. No. She's this woman who's, uh, she does, puts a lot on YouTube. I think Instagram, I don't use Instagram, but, um, and Facebook. And she's just like, her thing is she's, um, helping us to navigate the, this changing world that we're in and mm -hmm. this highly, like quickly evolving high paced evolution that we're going through. Right, right. And, uh, she uses words that just like, they just speak to me and every time I hear her she she says it well mm -hmm. and uh one thing she was saying is yesterday was uh you know we may be we're at a time where a lot of us are feeling that um the things that worked for us before are no longer working and it might be something that worked for you yesterday and it just you do it today and it doesn't work it just doesn't work whether what it, whatever it is if it's a, a habit if it's a relationship uh, some preference just no longer works and it's about you know she's recommending to it could be a job you know to tune into our resonance and i just like the word resonance like so if it feels like who you truly are and just yes. respecting that and going that direction yeah even if it seems like you're like kind of going against what you think is right on like a thinking level exactly. or like a habitual pattern level Exactly. Just going with it because the resonance is correct right. and creating these new patterns as a result and uh, the new world, you know, that's not going to look anything like the world that before it's going to look a hundred percent, thousand percent different. The world we're walking into, you know, it's very eloquent. Uh, yeah. It was very encouraging. Uh, this, the resonance concept, Lori Ladd, uh, L O R I E L A D E L A D D. I'll put her in the okay, links yeah. too. I'd yeah. love that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And what about you, Michael? Any uh, spiritual philosophy you care to share? You know, I feel that God put me on earth uh, to entertain people and to make them look at things in maybe ways they've never looked at them before. And on our last record was this highly offensive title that I said, we've got to do this song. It's called Fuck This Face. And, and I would go, oh, no, no. And most women I played that for, oh my God, you can't say that. And, and I said, well, that's going to be my challenge. I'm going to make it valid so people say, yes, that is worth the shock value. And I think I did um, because it's a self-confessional of a guy looking in a mirror and giving himself tough love. Mm -hmm. And I think men do that a little bit. They say, you stupid motherfucker. You know, they, they talk tough. They talk like other guys do to themselves. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe I'm the only one, but I, I have a feeling most men do. And, and it's kind of a, a male thing. I don't know if women do that. And um, I feel- I don't think they do that. No, but-, but Unless but, they've been highly masculinized. Well, there are women like that. But, but well, I mean, I, if they've I, grown I, up with brothers and that they've roughened their, and they're thick skinned to begin with, but I think most women would be like more like, not fuck this face, but like, oh dear. Yes, yeah, that you would know. be a nice way of saying it. Like, oh, but that's not a, such a great song. But that's more like. Oh, you could. I mean, that would be a but challenge fuck this to face write a song. more like called, angry. Yes. And Whereas, I was oh angry. dear is more like. I was sad. angry at myself. I, I, yeah, I woke up one morning. And I and I he looked in the mirror and I said, you know, fuck this face. You know, fuck all these lies that it's told, fuck that mouth and it's the lying tongue that's inside of it. Fuck this face. And I went on and waxed so. This somewhat. was autobiographical, huh? Well, it started off that way. Uh-huh. And then, then of course, you know, I mean, it became poetry, yes. And I think it would read as poetry if someone wanted to read it if they could get it past the censors but I mean you know it's just like showing naked women 
it can be pornography or it can be fine art. It just mm -hmm. depends on who did it. I mean, you, you look at a, a Renaissance nude of a woman, it's just as anatomically perfect as, as you know, pictures in a, in a magazine for, for men. But Yeah, but the intent is different. Again, vibration, energy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. purpose behind it, you know. So, that, that our body reads, that our heart reads. But I believe that the human spirit has ups and downs, dark and light, pure and impure. And I, I think that the job of the artist that I want to become is to touch on all those things and integrate them together uh, because that's the way life is. It's not all you know, cookies and tea at, at three in the afternoon on a doily. Mm -hmm. Only except at your grandmother's house. But uh, it's it's just not like that. There's a lot of contrast in it. And I think that the, the musicians I like ha have joyous and non-joyous parts of, of, of their work. And that's what makes them rich and that's what makes them resonate with with their audience. Yeah. And I, I have to, that. I have to um, mention, I didn't mention that, uh, Michael, I find your voice very, I'm, I'm sure someone's told you before that uh, you have like a radio voice. So like when I'm listening to, when I watch your skits and the voice is like kind of bringing, it's your voice and then Abby's voice, which is, you know, there's quite a contrast between that. Yours, it kind of reminds me of, don't take this the wrong way, but like a Casey Kasem type of voice, you know? Well, I'll take that the right way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, which is just, it's it's soothing, you know? It's like, it, it has a soothing quality to it. That's, uh, I don't know if hypnotic is, you know, but it just kind of puts you in this kind of like calming state. Even though what you're saying might be off the wall, it's like, I'm calm as I hear it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of cool. <laughs> Good to well, know. Casey Kasem was a, a local DJ in LA for years and years before he went. Yeah, when we were kids. Yeah, he was. Uh, we kind of grew up with him, and mm -hmm. you know, just he was very soothing and uh, very nice guy. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, he did a voiceover for me one time when I was working in advertising. Oh, yeah. So excited to meet him, and uh, he was just as nice as could be. Oh, well, that's good to know. Um, so uh, are there any, we're coming toward the end of our show here, are there any setbacks that you'd feel comfortable to share in which music has helped you to pull through? Maybe at times a dark night of the soul or whatever, it could be a less dramatic one where you're like, man, if that song or that album really just got me through this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, probably during college, I did a lot of listening to Joni Mitchell, and she she was wonderful. She was quite a role model for me when I was going through all the things one goes through in college with boys and classes and parents and, you know, um, I can't give you a specific circumstance. I know that music has pulled us through when we've, even when the music business has been cruel to us, like releasing this record that was put in a movie and it was a 12 inch vinyl just as CDs were coming in and they were eliminating 12 inches and everyone was going to compact discs and also what right when um, we put a high energy record out right when everything became house music I don't know if you're familiar with DJ music called house music but mm -hmm. it had been a few bad timing situations for us and that doesn't really answer your question that you're asking about a song that's really, you know, I mean, there's songs that I've had on repeat. Why don't you let me answer and then you think I'll about shut something. Up. No, no, you can just, go ahead. <laughs> when I, when I'm feeling down in the dumps, there's nothing like an up tempo song to bring me out of, um, I mean, wake me up before you go, go by wham mm -hmm. or, uh, I knew the bride when she used to rock and roll, or uh, oh, I don't know. Let's see what else. You star fucker by the Rolling Stones, or uh, 
you know, help me run to buy the Beach Boys or uh, I don't know what's the newest one that I really really like. Uh, what's that one by the Black Eyed Peas that I like so much? I got a feeling. Yeah, that's uh -huh. a good one that's too. great. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because that's that's the eurythmics I used to love when I heard "Sweet Dreams Are Made of These." I had to like pull over to the side of the road and go, "What is this? Who is this?" Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it it can change your endorphins. Music, I think, totally. at, at its at its best, it can make you really sad. It can make you contemplative, but the best thing about it is it can elevate your mood. Oh yeah, and you know that's one of the best experiences is to go to a concert where everybody is into it at the same time. Mm -hmm. I saw Moby at the um, at the Hollywood Palladium, which is, a, as I mentioned, a place that was built for big bands, stand-up notes. And mm -hmm. it was just him uh, playing to tracks with some really great lights. And that was like one of the best concerts I've ever seen, just because the music was so strong. He was so strong as an artist and portraying kind of an uplifting message. And right, yeah, he, uh, yeah, I know he's quite a positive uh, influence. Yeah. You walk out of there, you're like you're floating on a cloud. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, that's what I'm always trying to shoot for. What was this concert we saw where people were screaming at the end of it, I want my money back? No, was that was when Van Halen came back to play at the Forum or something. Oh. They they hadn't played in Los Angeles and it was their their farewell tour and they they played for like three hours and then the <laughs> curtain goes down and there's a hush silence and one asshole yells I want my money back. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> three hours. <laughs> Can you say that? Typical Van Halen fan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Van Halen thing. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a big Van Halen fan myself. Um, you used to see him at the, he, he lives not far from here. And it, there's a market. Well, he's dead now, but. Yeah, but when he was still alive. He, <laughs> he needed food and milk and bread just like everybody else. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, there he was. And he, he kind of looked like. Valerie someone, Bertinelli. No, well, Valerie they look Burton, just alike. Bert, Valerie Bertinelli kind of crossed with Charlie Manson, and mm. uh, but because he's a little wiry guy, and mm -hmm. uh, I mean we've seen Brooke Shelton there and uh, Brooke Shelton. Yeah, that's not his name. No, but that's his name, Brooke Shelton. No, the guy. that you're thinking of Brooke. Uh, Brooke Shelton is his name. No, the, the guy, guy who's married to Lady Gaga. <laughs> oh no, he's married to Michael. To, you have uh, to get up on your contemporary pop he's, artist. He's, he's married Blake to Shelton. Blake, that's what Gwen I said. Stephanie. No, yeah. you said Brooke. Oh, Brooke Shelton. You're thinking about Brooke Garth Brooks. <laughs> yes, I didn't see him he, because he wouldn't take his head out of the burrito factory. So, um, but we we do live in a place where where you see all these these celebrities. We have a there's, a, there's a Kroger, well, it's owned by Kroger's, but it's mm -hmm. called Ralph's Market. Mm -hmm. And we call it the movie star Ralph's because you always see movie stars. Yeah, wow. Well. Late at night. They mm -hmm. go late at night. Interesting. So can you guys share up to three inspiring books, films, shows, albums, whatever, three things that uh, yeah, you I, like to I recommend to our listeners? I thought about that. There's um, some really good TV going on now. I think film and TV have kind of swapped places where film has become more like the bubblegum fair. And so that there's, we watched a TV show your viewers may be uh, familiar with called Steisel. It's an Israeli story, uh, Israeli TV series about an Orthodox community in Jerusalem. And it's about an artist, a young, he's the youngest in the family and he's, you know, really a painter of quite amazing talent, but he struggles with, you know, the rules and regulations. It's just fascinating how they bend the rules to still do the life they want to do, but still all the peer pressure of being an orthodox anything. Um, and it has a beautiful composition by a, a composer named Avi Bellelli that you hear the theme song each time the show starts. So that's a wonderful show. 
And then there was another show that um, was kind of a BBC production, I think, called Gentleman Jack, which is based on a, a woman named Ann Lister, who was a real woman. She was an industrialist and a big landowner, um, but she was gay, and she wrote copious journal entries, but all in code, about her lesbian love affairs, and they made a series about her, and it's just wonderful. The actress who plays her, Sir Ann Jones, I think her name is. It's just, it's witty, it's it's fascinating, and again, a great theme song. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other, I was just gonna recommend a fun um, sitcom called Be Positive, which was with Thomas Middleditch, who used to be in Silicon Valley, if your viewers are TV watchers and Anna Lee Ashford, who's a Broadway star, but also does a lot of um, film and TV, who's just wonderful. It's really a kick. It's about a guy who needs a kidney transplant. <clears throat> his, um, the woman who's gonna give him his kidney, played mm -hmm. by this ditzy, you know, the girl in school who was like the drunk and the, you know, the never went to school and she's goofy. And it's a very funny kind of odd couple pairing. Oh, thank so you. that's it for TV, and I know some books too, but Michael, you go. Um, I'd have to say that um, it, for books, I think there was a book out about 10 years ago called The Corrections by Jonathan Franzen, which uh, was a wonderful contemporary book about America and American families. And... Um, and I always liked Tender is the Night by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Mm. And for movies, a couple of years ago, we went to see this Japanese movie called Shoplifters. And it was so engrossing and heartbreaking that we had to sit there for like 10 minutes. We just couldn't move. So those are the things. And then I haven't heard the whole record, but this girl's name, I think Olivia Rodrigo, She's a new pop sensation. Yeah, and she's kind of, uh, everything I've heard from the record has been really, really good. And um, and I like some K-pop, too. Yeah. I don't think it's going to change anybody's life, but it's so well put together and so evocative of American culture, uh, seen through different lenses, that mm -hmm. I think, wow, this is... This is really interesting how American culture has gone out and come back the same but slightly different. Yeah. John mm -hmm. Henry, I know a book too to recommend and I thought you might be interested because it takes place a large part of it in the Brooklyn Naval Yards. Oh, right. <clears throat> I don't know if it's if that's still extant or it's been Yeah, no, it's longer. it's no longer functioning, but uh, my grim parents met at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So. Wow. Well, this book is called Manhattan Beach by Jennifer mm -hmm. Egan, E-G-A-N, who also wrote A Visit from the Goon Squad, which is a lot about the music business. That's a really good one, too. This, this is a very different kind of narrative, but it's a story about a, the first woman who became like a Navy diver, you know, inspecting subs and boats and but it's more than that. It's like a mystery, and it's very beautifully written. And I thought, since that's kind of your hometown, you might want to check it out. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. I appreciate that. Manhattan Beach, by the way, is a, a beach in Brooklyn that we, oh, we okay. go to in the summer. Yeah. Oh, great. It's South. also a beach in Los Angeles. Yeah, it's a neighborhood in. It's a city. It's a city. Yeah, a coastal city. Manhattan Beach, but, in yeah. LA County. It's, hmm. it's, yeah, it's not part of LA, but it's in the county. Cool, thank you. Um, any other book that you want to share, uh, Abby? Or, I, or? I, I did, I was gonna suggest just, it's kind of a fun read if, if anybody's interested in musical theater, uh, it's called Unmasked, and it's the autobiography of by Andrew Lloyd Webber. So Ooh, if anybody okay. is interested in composition and collaboration, how musicals are brought from their nascent form to their feet and you know, I wasn't a big, um, what is that one called? The famous one he did with the mask, the Family Phantom. Family Phantom, thank you. I always get it mixed up with uh, the French one, but 
that was okay, but the, I loved Evita, so I, I was a fan just from Evita, but mm -hmm. he's written a lot and he talks all about collaborators and Tim Rice and um, it's a good read. It's a long read, but it's very blithe, you know, it's as you it might expect from him. He kind of glosses through a lot of stuff that I imagine other people involved might take exception to his interpretation of events, but that's probably true of any autobiography. What was, that, what was that one with Jeff Bridges that he played the country singer in that? What was that called? Something Rhodes or I forget. Someone just asked me. Someone was just saying they'd seen it and loved it. And it was good. Saw him, uh, listening to a song from it. Hmm. Yeah, I, I forget the name of that. Oh, but. you know what? You know what? I can I can recommend a movie for people who like music called The Sound of Metal. Oh yeah. <laughs> Have you seen that? No. That's on Netflix. I You'd really Amazon, like that. It's about a drummer who becomes deaf. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. It's a wonderful It's wonderful. so well done. Hmm. I think the guy who stars in it actually won like a Golden Globe already. Yeah. I don't think that it ended the Oscars, but for what, what awards are worth. <laughs> Interesting. All right. So is it about heavy metal or, or no? Well, he's kind of yeah. It's, he's in a yeah, band that's kind of a screamer metal. Yeah, band. yeah. It's it's. I mean, he's in a like a like a I think a, tr a power trio with his girlfriend, uh, and you it's know he's really a you know a, a headbanger yeah. and and it's the story of his gradually, but then really quickly lo losing his hearing and have to deal with that and it's just a powerful story a lot of unexpected places it goes and it's and also a, a really intense and i think underrated movie is uncut gems i don't like that about the uh, diamond trade with adam sandler oh yeah mm -hmm. i think that's set in new york too it's, uh, we oh, liked yeah. also downsizing i don't know uh, I, someone else recommended oh i think Maybe someone else recommended that. Two to three years ago it's been, but Matt Damon mm -hmm. and um, Christopher Waltz. Is Christopher Waltz in it yeah. or that other German oh, actor? That other German, you're right. right. And um, I forget who played his wife, but that is that is really, it's funny, but it's also really disturbing. It's kind of like a sci-fi comedy with social commentary, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Life now. Yeah, really, you've got your viewing and reading and listening set for, for a long time. Great. And your next guest is going to give you more, so let us yeah, know if you ever get to the bottom of it. I don't think I will, but it, it, it'll live in the show notes. So if I'm looking for something in, in five years from now, I'm like, I just really need a good movie. Yeah. And you just go through the show notes and yeah, come perfect. up with, oh, I didn't get to this one yet. Yeah. Um, so if you'd like to share, what are your plans uh, in the next upcoming several months or the next year? Yeah. Well, we've got, uh, we're, we're in process of doing some animated videos, working with animators, one in Atlanta, the other in Florence, Italy, a, a couple of our songs. Um, and then we're planning to do uh, kind of a concept album about Songs about cats. Mm -hmm. so. Cool. I, I wouldn't, uh, whatever you said, it would not surprise me. See, here's <laughs> Annabelle, our inspiration, Annabelle is sleeping behind me. Yeah, I saw her uh, prancing around before. Yeah. Actually, she's monitoring the uh, proceedings. She's going to give us her notes. She's Yeah, she's going to give mm -hmm. us notes, and then she's going to give us notes to give you. Because she's mm -hmm. very, you know, she's yeah. got a Fair strong right. opinion. Yeah. She's mm -hmm. going to have actually her own show. She's been planning it. So, okay. very creative household. Yeah, I see. Cool. Um, so, uh, where can people find find you and learn more about what you have to offer? I'll put again, I'll put the links in the show notes. Um, we have a Facebook page. We have a YouTube page. We have a Wikipedia page. Google is the best way Google, to find Yeah, us. go through Google, um, discogs.com. Discogs.com. For our uh, discography. Uh, we have our own Spotify website. Spotify is a good place. Yeah, well, Spotify YouTube. has everything released. 
And then we have our own www.tyrantsintherapy.com. That's where our website is. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Cool. So uh, Abby and Michael, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for sitting down, having a nice, casual, uh, deep and colorful conversation with me. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for all the same. Yeah. And I'll, uh, I'll have one room. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll, I'll have the links. Uh, I'll put the uh, YouTube up tonight. I'll send the link. And then as far as getting you uh, a file, I'll, I'll put in the next day or two, I can do that. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Michael and Abby, have a great night. And thanks, thanks again. Man. And thank you everyone for watching. Until next time, signing out. Bye-bye.